Welcome everyone. I'm Lauren Leader, CEO and co-founder of All In Together. Uh, All In Together is a nonpartisan women's political leadership organization, and we are so thrilled to have partnered with Participant Media to bring this special screening of John Lewis Good Trouble uh, to our friends and members around the country. We're especially pleased today to have this fantastic panel of incredible activists with us to talk about the legacy of John Lewis's incredible work in voting access and the work really that we have before us to ensure the equal access of all Americans to the ballot in this critical time. With me, I'm joined today by Christine Chen uh, of APIA Vote, Jeanette Senecal of the League of Women Voters, and Jessica Knight Henry from the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, the DSCC. I'm so pleased to have all of you, and maybe we'll just start by letting each of you talk for a minute about the incredible work you do in your organizations. Uh, and I'll start with you, Jessica. Awesome, well, hello, um, and thanks for, for having me join you today. Um, John Lewis is certainly a hero of, of mine. Um, I grew up in South Mississippi, so really pleased to, to be here and talk about uh, what we can do. Um, as many of you know, uh, the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee is a sister committee for the Democratic Party that is focused uh, solely on electing Democratic senators. Um, and we are one of the only entities that can work directly with candidates. Our goal is to advise, help coordinate spending, and, and process sort of a, a transfer down. We're uniquely positioned to make other crucial investments um, that help us uh, march towards a, a more uh, Democratic majority in the United States Senate. Thanks. Jeanette, can you share with us? I think everybody sort of knows the League of Women Voters, but they may not know the amazing work that you're doing there. So if you could talk a little bit about the League of Women Voters today and, and what you're doing. Sure, great. Thanks for having us join you today in this really important conversation. So I'm Jeanette Senecal with the League of Women Voters. We are a nonpartisan nationwide organization. We're organized in more than 750 communities across the country where we year round every year do voter registration, education, mobilization, and protection work. One of our biggest programs is actually vote411.org, which is an online resource where any voter anywhere in the country can go to find the information that they need to successfully navigate the election from polling place locations to identification requirements, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm very proud of the work that we're doing right now to really make sure that underrepresented communities really have the tools and the information that they need. And also that we're doing the hard work, whether it's through litigation or mobilization work or organizing work, to uh, make sure voting rights are protected in communities across the country. Thank you so much. And Christine Chen. Hi, thank you so much for the invitation to participate. Um, I'm Christine Chen, Executive Director for Asian and Pacific Islander American Vote. We're a national nonprofit organization that um, our model is to identify local Asian American Pacific Islander nonprofits to help build their capacity to um, increase voter registration, voter education, get out the vote activities, as well as uh, voter protection. Um, so uh, in addition to working with nonprofits, we also work on college campuses, identifying local student organizations in about 40 different campuses across the country and working with a lot of the student regional networks as well. Um, we also have identified that there's really a lack of data about the Asian American Pacific Islander electorate. So we've been a leader and champion in conducting with our partners a in-language uh, polling every two years. And that provides a lot of the context in terms of as we head into the presidential election cycle about our understanding of this particular community. Actually, it's a great place to start. And I want, I've read your research. I think it's amazing and it's super interesting. And I think a lot of Americans don't realize, you know, what a fast growing community of voters the Asian Pacific Islander community is. It's next to the Latino voters, really the fastest growing number of new voters to American democracy. Um, can you just speak for a minute about that? Because I'm obviously, it's an incredible transformation in terms of just the whole landscape of the American electorate, but the Asian Pacific Islander community is a big part of that. So can you just talk about those new voters and uh, what you're doing to bring them to the polls? 
Yes, I mean, it's been very exciting to, to see the increase of the population since 2000, but um, I would say, especially when you look at the midterm elections and local elections, we've been proving where the growth, especially like in Nevada, Texas, North Carolina, Georgia, um, it really can make a difference, especially when we work in a broader coalition um, to really bring out um, these communities of color to, uh, to go out and register and to go out and vote. Um, because we are a newer population, a lot of our work is really about educating um, this population about um, how do you actually become a U.S. citizen and then from that transform yourself into a voter, but not only to register and vote on a presidential election, but then to turn them into regular voters. So that means um, making sure that we have trusted messengers within the community resonating this information, um, that we also provide in language material. So API mm -hmm. Vote, we work with our partners in any given cycle, we're translating into like 14 different languages, depending on the community that we're focusing on in particular state. So like Minnesota, we're gonna focus on Hmong voters um, versus wow. a Nevada be like Filipino voters. So it's a great um, segue to start talking about voting and ballot access. You know, obviously the COVID crisis has created a sort of unprecedented set of challenges for just fundamentally getting people to the polls. I mean, even just the idea of that, we, we always talk about it as getting to the polls, when in fact, in many communities, um, going to the polls will not be the way uh, folks vote in the fall. Uh, the proliferation of possibilities around absentee vote by mail, which is very inconsistent from state to state, very even more confusing uh, for somebody who isn't an expert in this. So, you know, Jeanette, maybe I'll start with you. And then Jessica, you know, I would love to hear how you guys are thinking about it in terms of turnout because look, Jessica, in the in the voter 411, I mean, it's just never been more complicated. All in together this year also put on our website a state by state voter resource guide that was trying, you know, really worked hard to stay on top of each state's new regulations around uh, vote by mail and ballot access. It, it's been changing all the time. So can you just talk about that? Like in this hyper complicated environment where people may be concerned about their health and safety for physically going to the polls, talk about what we need, how people can get the right information, you know, to get to know how to vote in this cycle, like what we need to do to make it more accessible. There's just so much to talk about even in the, the context of COVID and ballot access. I think there's about 25 million different things we could probably talk oh. about in relation to all of that. You know, one of the most important things is this specific election cycle with COVID, we've never lived through something like this before. Yeah. We've never had so many rules changing immediately before an election day. And many of those rules were only changed for the primary and have yet to be changed for the general election. So voters might face different rules come for an upcoming election than what they just followed for an election they participated in, you know, three or six months earlier. So this year particularly is important that we help voters really know where to go to find the trusted information and make sure that that information is going to be updated on a regular basis. I mean, there were states where we were literally updating four or five times a day as lawsuits were determined, then they were challenged, they were overturned. And we were providing that, uh, the alerts for specific changes in both English and Spanish. And so making sure all that content was available to everybody and up to date is very critical. But one of the pieces I really don't want us to lose in this conversation is about accessibility, right? Yes, we are seeing a lot of excitement and we're seeing a lot of turnout, uh, high turnout in these primaries that were uh, by vote by mail predominantly in many states. But we don't actually know what that means across communities and across um, different demographics. And it's really important that we maintain in-person voting opportunities and that we're really looking at expanding in-person early voting opportunities so that we're taking some of the pressure off of election day. And even with the by mail systems, all the education that we can do is great, but we need to make sure that we have ballot boxes located in communities of color so that people can drop off their ballots, that we're thinking through where those ballot drop off locations are, we're thinking through where the in person voting needs to be so that there's a balance between what the elections officials can do and what the community's needs truly are. And I love to hear from some of the colleagues on the yeah. panel about, you know, some of the very specific needs. Yeah, I mean, Jessica, everybody saw, I mean, I think lots of people saw the videos of folks in Kentucky you know, literally pounding on the doors 
in order to try to get into a polling place, one of the only three polling places in the entire state for that Senate, you know, for the primary, but also because there was this, you know, very high profile Senate primary as well. Um, what are you seeing in terms of, you know, just like all the work that the candidates have to do even just to make sure that their own uh, supporters have the information that they need to get to the polls? Certainly. And as Jeanette mentioned, like a lot of this information is sort of fast moving and late breaking. Um, the DSCC has right now um, actually brought up more voting rights litigation um, than lawsuits than, than any other organization. We are doing that in conjunction with uh, other uh, sort of sister committees as well, but it is something that we are really um, highly focused on. Um, in addition to Kentucky, there were widespread issues um, in Georgia uh, for, for that um, primary as well. And the Secretary of State, um, you know, we, we know what that looks like. We saw and obviously still feel very viscerally um, about Stacey Abrams and the work that she's doing there. But they failed voters across that state with how poorly that election was run. And, and we unfortunately saw that um, mirrored in Kentucky as well. Um, we have called for full investigations um, on all of these alarming and preventable problems that, that voters face at the polls in both of those states. Um, but in spite of those voting issues and obstacles, we, we saw that um, from our side, Democratic participation was extremely high. Um, and in Georgia, it appears that the Democrats outvoted Republicans um, in that primary election for the first time since 2008. And they've outperformed um, 2016 turnout. And it may have even set um, a new turnout record um, for the primary. And again, similarly with Kentucky, um, just the sort of the lens that was placed on on that race and, and seeing um, you know, what we saw there is something that we're very focused on. But as we talk about communities of color and, and how disenfranchisement continues to take place, one of the things that we're focused on, in addition to obviously letting people know about the great candidates that we've got in, in many of these states that are targeted um, throughout um, this cycle, but is voter education. Um, Black voters very specifically are in-person day of voters. Um, they are, it is ingrained in the culture um, to go in on election day and, and to, to fight for that right. So really sort of educating people and retraining them on, on what early vote looks like and making sure that all that information is, is readily available. Um, in addition to all of the myriad of options for um, misinformation um, that can come down from a number of places. And so really trying to sort of sift through that uh, we are at the DSCC are, are able to sort of help take the load off a lot of our campaigns by providing some of that IT infrastructure um, and providing uh, what we would see, uh, you know, as sort of these sort of soft targets uh, with a lot of our campaign offices and even and even state parties. But um, it, it certainly is one of those things that, you know, continues to develop. We are very proud of one of the lawsuits that we had in North Carolina that, that sort of uh, clawed back the last Saturday of early vote um, in that state. And we saw that nearly 90,000 African Americans voted on that last day of early wow. vote in North Carolina. And so we're proud to say that we fought to, to bring that back. You know, Christine, as we think about the battles for voting rights and the legacy of John Lewis and his efforts, obviously, which were so focused on the African American community, but have implications really for all underrepresented communities across the United States. How did the ballot access these sort of challenges in communities that obviously are being raised in terms of uh, communities of color? How are those affecting uh, the Asian and Pacific Islander community? Obviously, you mentioned there's you know sometimes language barriers there as well. Like, how do you think about these issues in terms of? ensuring the enfranchisement of uh, Asian and Pacific Islander voters? I mean, for new immigrants, we've really benefited from the work of John Lewis and others, um, especially in the African-American um, community, um, because they really were looking at ballot access for all and really looking at it in totalities, which also meant um, language access, right? And so, um, and we've been able to really look at 
the models of how they conduct voter engagement and outreach and try to replicate and modify that for our own communities. Um, because um, our history um, in terms of voting is fairly new um, just because of our immigration or, and our ability to even become US citizens is actually fairly new when you look at American history in itself. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also in terms of even looking at um, for this election about um, how do we access mail-in ballots and that culture, uh, I would say for Asian American Pacific Islander voters, we're fortunate that a large bulk of our population is also in California, in Washington, in Oregon, where those states have a history of utilizing mail-in ballots and um, permanent absentee ballots. And right. so... For us, we've also noted that a number of our communities early on have always um, had difficulty because they're small business owners and uh, couldn't necessarily make it um, out on election day. So we've been actually for several um, cycles, we've been pushing and advocating that they look into these alternative ways to go out and vote versus on election day. So we can't talk about John Lewis or voting rights or the upcoming election uh, without talking about the incredible moment that we are experiencing in the um, through the activism and the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement and the ways in which George Floyd's horrible death catalyzed and emboldened so many Americans to become civically engaged in some way. And, you know, protest is enshrined in the First Amendment, people forget that the right of Americans to petition our grievances is enshrined uh, in that First Amendment to the Constitution. It is like the most essential in some ways act of, one of the most essential acts of democratic participation. And yet there is also this question about whether or not the mass mobilization, especially of younger folks um, who have participated in uh, marches in just unbelievable unprecedented numbers, whether that will also translate into participation in the structural political process of voting. Um, I know there's been, there were lots of efforts to get folks registered to vote out at Black Lives Matter rallies around the country. Um, and also we've had some challenges in the past with younger uh, Americans turning out, seeing the vote that voting is a valid and meaningful part of the process. Um, so, you know, I just want to put that out there to any of you, um, you know, maybe Jeanette, we'll start with you, but just the, what is your sense about how this big galvanizing moment of activism uh, will translate to the polls? What, what's, what are you seeing? And then we'll go to you, Jessica. Great. I, you know, this moment in time, again, we're living through one unprecedented event after another unprecedented event. And if you think about young people, communities of color, um, the league has been out there registering voters at some of these events. And um, what we're really finding is people are seeing that their vote is one way to address the inequities that they're seeing and the injustices that they're seeing in their communities, that this is one way to start addressing those things and making a difference and having a say in their community. Young people have been turning out to vote. Uh, you know, the narrative that young people don't turn out is one that we've been really pushing back on. And the league actually has a large program where we focus on uh, high school students every year to do voter registration activity. And then we keep in touch with those students to invite them to participate and ask them to turn out and ask them to engage their own communities and their own friends and family, et cetera. Unfortunately, this year, right, schools were closed during the time frame, and most high school students were would be eligible to register and vote this year. So we actually turned online and we put together a presentation that we worked with many of our partnering teachers to get them to fold that into their curriculum and the, the distance learning programs that they were doing. Either they could do it themselves or we could still lead that for them if they wanted to. You know, many schools were just doing their best to actually get distance learning off the ground since that wasn't something they had actually planned to do. Um, so it wasn't uh, integrated as much as we might have liked to see, but whatever the community is, right now we're, do, we're seeing so much online organizing because most of the in-person activity is, you know, on hold. And yeah. so the real thing is, this is about people. When you're doing voter registration or voter education in person, it's about people. It's about making the ask. It's about connecting with people. And it, the same thing goes with online organizing. You need yeah. to make the ask. You need to connect with people. You build those relationships. Yeah. So 
you know, right now, this moment, I think people are saying there's injustice, we need to do something, and it's not slowing down. I mean, here in DC, we have rally after rally, demonstration after demonstration. This isn't going away, and hopefully it doesn't, because this can be a very galvanizing moment. Right. And the 2018 midterms saw, you know, really record turnout of younger voters in ways that I think surprised a lot of people. It certainly surprised me. It was an area that I was worried about whether or not folks would really turn out in those midterms, and they clearly did. Jessica, as you think about the extraordinary transformative effect of uh, the Black Lives Matter momentum, if you will, the ways in which it's really become so um, such a huge part of our national conversation. What's your feeling about how that's going to really impact people's commitment to voting and to turning out around these issues? Yeah, I think for 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 me, it was you know yet again another sort of black body being disrespected in this way. And we know that it just doesn't exist in the form of police brutality. That is one of the ways that, that it exists. Um, but there are just numerous ways of uh, systemic inequality um, and oppression that sort of trickle down to all, all spectrums um, and to largely a lot of communities of color. And so um, I, for one, have been really, you know, em- emboldened and hopeful um, for seeing the young people take it to the streets and, you know, you know, there's one sign that kind of that stuck with me that's like you mess with the last generation and so I grew up in the South and respectability politics and growing up and, you know, being palatable. Um, to a white audience to a certain extent. And I think that's how we, you know, took a a crack at our our sort of take to politics was like, we must conform to the system. But I see now that that folks are making the system conform and and work for us. And in 2018, we saw that because we had a record number of diverse candidates running, people who represented the the constituencies um, of the United States of America. And I think young people saw that and, and were, actually motivated in a way. Um, And I think it's it's taken a while. I think a lot of it goes back to some basic civics, but it's really hard to care, um, particularly at the federal level, when you are not necessarily even in an urban center, potentially a rural area, and you don't see any of that change. And so to be defeated and apathetic comes so naturally. Um, And so to see people risking their bodies and then seeing the reaction um, to, from their government towards people who are just um, utilizing their First Amendment rights, I think has really made people recognize that this government is really, really out of touch. And so I think we're going to see that, that trickle down to um, some enthusiasm um, for Election Day as well. You know, it's such a different time, obviously, but, you know, it's hard not to think about, first of all, how young John Lewis was when he was first arrested when he was, you know, brutalized for protesting for his rights. Uh, you know, I think it's 56 years ago. He was a young man and it's an incredible model. And in a sense, we're seeing today those kinds of, I think you're right, Jessica, like those kinds of galvanizing moments that just feel so personal to people that you can't help but to stand up and speak out in a way that I don't think we've ever had in Well, we have had a multitude of experiences like that in our generation, and yet they they translated in small ways. Um, To bring this all together in uh, and tie this together to from John Lewis to 2020, um, I'd love for each of you, and I'll start with you, Christine, just to a couple of thoughts. The most important things that we can do to help ensure uh, that every eligible American votes, turns out, participates uh, in this cycle. What can each of us do uh, to support uh, voting rights, to support the legacy of John Lewis, to make sure we have a full and representative democracy? Right. Well, seeing that, I I truly believe that this pandemic is not going to go away for the rest of the year, unfortunately. And so we are going to be Um, continue to connect up with our family and friends and checking in on them. But this is our time to also integrate into our conversations about the elections and making sure that they're registered, that they're having discussions about what is on the on the ballot and ensuring that they have a plan on how they're going to be able to cast that vote. 
I think if you look at the numbers, we cannot assume that all your family and friends are ready and willing to actually register and go vote. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we get over that assumption and start those conversations. Okay, friends and family, make your plans. Jeanette? I think Christina or Christine hit it the nail right on the head. You know, this is voting and community power is about the people. And we need people to reach out to other people. When you are a candidate or an elected official, you go out and you meet people and you invite them in. We need to be inviting every single person we meet into the election space. We need to be telling them we welcome their voice. We want your voice. We need your voice uh, to be heard this cycle. And here's the information you need to successfully navigate it. You know, we saw tens of thousands of ballots have been thrown away because people didn't sign them or people didn't lick the envelope or it was in the wrong envelope. There's a variety of things that were challenging through litigation to make some of those changes so it's easier for voters, but Whatever the rules are, we need to be helping voters know what they are so that their ballot is counted. And there's so much opportunity for all of us to be reaching out into our communities to do that voter education. Jessica? Yeah, I think sort of um, just um, jumping off of, of what you said, Jeanette, is the education piece and, and doing our part to make sure that from my side, the, can the candidates are, are educating folks and, and speaking to issues that, that individuals care about um, so they can feel like their voices will be heard and the issues that they care about um, are, are seen. But, you know, I think that we are, you know, not only the pandemic, but what we've seen with sort of, you know, the election essentially being stolen from us, you know, left after right in 2016 and what we saw um, in 2018 in Georgia is just to make sure that we are, you know, prepared to fight. Um, this is not going to be an election day where anything is is known the day of. It's, you know, ballots are going to be all over the place. And so, you know, letting people know that we're going to have to, one, be prepared, be educated, have a keen eye as to what disinformation looks like. Again, talk to our friends and families, but, you know, be ready to, to rally immediately to make sure that we're shaking those tables um, to make sure that our voices are heard and that every vote is counted in the aftermath as well. One thing I would really like to add about what people can do for their communities is be a poll worker. We need people so good. To, we need people to come and be poll workers who feel comfortable and confident and have the safety equipment they need. We need elections officials to make sure our polling places are safe so poll workers can come out. But we need the people to do that work if we really yeah. want to make sure that we have early voting and in-person voting available. You know, I'm so glad you said that because I think people don't appreciate um, how much demand we really have right now for poll workers because we where, where there is early voting, there's additional demand, but also because historically poll workers have been a lot of senior citizens, retirees and senior citizens, who right now are very concerned about their health and safety and may not be comfortable physically coming to the polls. And people don't realize how easy it is to get trained. You don't have to have any background or experience. Your state uh, board of elections will train you to be a poll worker. Uh, it's paid. Uh, it's a really important thing that um, we need people to do. Thank you so much for raising that, Jeanette. I mean, I know my, you know, I know people in my family have been poll workers and they're just not, gonna, they're too afraid to do it this year uh, for their own health and safety. So thank you for raising that. So I'll add mine, which is that we need to hold our state elected officials accountable for ensuring ballot access and clear and concise and timely information to voters about their ability, when, where, why, and how to vote in this and every election cycle. Um, I, I think one thing we've learned in this pandemic, state and local government has never mattered more and it's critical that we engage at the state and local level to hold those leaders accountable to us, the voters. So with that, I wanna say a huge thank you to all of you for the work that you do to carry forward John Lewis's extraordinary legacy and leadership to ensure, um, our, the, the, to ensure our functioning and thriving democracy uh, for ourselves, for our families, for our communities. Uh, for everyone that plays a part in shaping our nation. And thank you all so much for being a part of this and all of your work.